Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Namaste Experience on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Hmm. Let's see where Holy Spirit takes us today. What, one of the things that, that I've realized and just had a demonstration of a few moments ago is that uh, the Holy Spirit has its way of ordering our thoughts and experience, and it may be very different than the way that we want that to happen. We, we want everything to be in, a, in a, a line, a nice organized line that we determine to make sense or to have value. And yet that which so often makes sense to us or has value for us is actually taking us in the wrong direction. I've used the example before of, of paddling a boat upstream rather than just letting the current take you without effort to the infinite ocean of grace. And the effort and the, and the, the, the muscle power that it takes to, to, to paddle upstream and we just say, this is the way of the world. This is just how it is. And you are right. That is how it is in the world of separation. It's hard. It's difficult. It takes a lot of energy. But that is not the way of spirit. The way of spirit is stop paddling. Let the boat right itself. Let the current take you. It has a whole different means that is not aligned with the egoic split mind, but is fully al aligned with the mind of Christ. Okay? So I had an idea uh, uh, that uh, I will share of where we were going to go. But right before, like literally as Scott was singing, I, I saw um, the blue book, of Course in Miracles, sitting there in the other room. So I just opened it up. And so I just want to read this one paragraph, and we'll see where this takes us. And what relevance it has. It says, there is indeed a difference between your vain imaginings and vision. There's a difference between vain imaginings and vision. The difference lies not in them, but in their purpose. What is their purpose? Both are but a means each one appropriate to the end for which it is employed. Each one is a means that is heading in the direction that you choose. In other words, separation or oneness. Neither can serve the purpose of the other. Obviously, the Holy Spirit can't serve separation. And the ego cannot serve oneness. Neither can serve the purpose of the other, for each one is a choice of purpose employed on its behalf, either is meaningless without the end for which it was intended, nor is it valued as a separate thing apart from the intentions. The means seems real. This is important. The means seems real because the goal is valued. You have given value to the goal that you have set before you. And therefore, if the goal, even if it's a hidden grievance of separation, if the goal is to remain isolated, separated, under attack, then that's going to seem very real to you. But if the goal is oneness, unity, awakening, then the Holy Spirit can use whatever goal that you give to it to achieve that purpose. And judgment has no value unless the goal is sin. Judgment has no value unless the goal is sin. And of course, the ego's goal is only sin. The ego's goal is, is only you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter which direct, as long as there's someone who's right and someone is wrong. Because that proves separation. You know, I was, we were just talking, of course, at the breakfast table, and, and one of the things that came out is that no matter what I say, like what I'm saying right now, it's always wrong. It's never right. However, it can be useful. We can use whatever, even if it seems furthest from the truth or closest, we can use it for a divine purpose, but it's never right because they're always just a collection of symbols. 
words that are twice removed from the truth. So never cling to a, a particular holy gospel. I hate to use that word, but, but, or doctrine, let's use that word. Don't cling to any doctrine because you can throw it out the next moment. But if it's useful in the moment to get you to, to let go of the vain imaginings of the ego and have true vision, the vision that is given to us by the Holy Spirit, then it's useful and use it. So that's what that brought about to me this morning. Now, something else that was useful in this regard, right before um, I came out, I, I went on, for some reason, I went on to CNN.com. And, and there was, there was, and once again, either useful or not useful. If I want to, to, to look at it as news or as what I, it seems to be happening in the world and the dysfunction therein, I can use it and it will be very unuseful. But I can also say, Holy Spirit, teach me what I need to learn from this. So the first thing that I landed on was an article about um, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Okay? You guys remember that from your psychology classes, the Maslow hierarchy of needs? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up on the, uh, on the screen here because I, I, I've made a couple of, of graphics. So... Let me put this up on the screen so we can look at it together. All right, let me put it full screen. So this is the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs, just to remind you. So it begins with the most dense. And as it goes up, the pyramid arrives at the most free. So we begin with this, the physiological needs, which are just the, the, the basic needs that we have as a body, the need for air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction. Those are the basic needs that we as animals experience. But then as, as the frequency rises, we come to safety. What are our safety needs? Personal security, employment, resources, health. Okay, and, and notice how the, the higher we, we go on the, the pyramid, the less space it takes up, okay? So now we're into love and belonging. So we have friendship, intimacy, family. Now, finally, we're getting close to the top. We have esteem. We want to be respected. We want to have status, recognition, that kind of thing, okay? And finally, at the very top of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have self-actualization. Now, I don't really like that one because I would say self-actualization is really kind of the first. What, what we're really, well, maybe self with a capital S. That'll, that'll work for me. The, the, the higher true self being fully activated, the desire to become the most one can be. So that is the, the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And once again, you, you see it, uh, becoming more and more pointed the higher it goes. Now, that being said, it reminded me of something that, that I shared. I don't even remember when it began, but uh, you probably remember Reaganomics. How many of you remember Reaganomics? Okay, we're all old enough. And Reagan had a thing called the trickle-down theory of oh, yeah. economics which I think is insane, but, you know, makes sense to a lot of, a lot of people. The idea, basically, if, if we put all the resources to the top, it'll trickle down and everybody else will get benefit. Okay, that was the idea. But what, what I realized uh, and, and, and kind of shifted into was the trickle-down theory of enlightenment. Okay, so let me see if I can bring that up now. I like right before breakfast, I, I went into m one of the programs I have on my computer and, and I made this little graphic. And it, it really doesn't fully capture what I want it to capture, but it gives you an idea. So, this is the trickle down theory of enlightenment. It begins here at the very bottom the need. 
to survive. Once again, the very bottom and the biggest is the uh, the the most dense, the most gross. Okay, something that that we experience as as people, as animals, the need to survive, security, to be safe. Right. This starts from the very beginning of our lives as children. We want to, to be in our mother's arms because we feel safe there. We don't want to be isolated and alone because we feel unsafe. So this is the very bottom. And then, of course, as we go up and we start to get a little bit older, the need to dominate begins to, to take place. We, we see that especially in boys. Boys want to dominate one, and girls do it too, just in different ways. I, I've often felt that, especially in in middle school, boys will just punch you. Right? You'll just—I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm rolling around the the the, the playground uh, fighting, and then ten minutes later, you're friends again. You know, that's just how men are, and boys. Women do it more psychologically. Am I right about that? The attack is more psychological rather than physical, and they can hold on to it a lot longer. I'm getting off track. Okay. So the need to dominate. This is, once we have our security needs taken care of, we, we go up a little bit more in the frequency, but it's not a lot higher than need to dominate. But pretty soon we, we come into the need to belong, to, to have community. To come together as we as we are here, whether we're here physically or on Zoom. And then finally, oneness, the breakthrough, the experience, the namaste experience that we talk about here every day. Where we break, it's like when you're on an airplane and and, and you know how there'll, there'll be a, you, you look up from the ground, it's just cloudy. There's clouds, just a bank of clouds everywhere. But, but as you're taking off, there comes a point where the, the, the airplane breaks through that bank of clouds. And what happens? Suddenly, blue sky. You're above the fray now. Okay. And now you're experiencing something that you could not have experienced, say, at the lower levels. So this, this is where it comes back to the, the trickle-down theory of economics. If you were to start at the bottom and your focus is, is simply to survive or security needs, and that becomes your focus, then that will be taken care of on some level. But if you, if you ascend to the level of domination, then you will learn how to dominate, you'll learn how to control your environment, and your need to survive will also be taken care of. You see how this is working? When, when you get to the point where you, 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 you fulfill the need to belong, your community, not only will that be taken care of, but so will your need to dominate, so will your need to survive. But the breakthrough, like the plane breaking through the, the clouds, is oneness. Now, without any action on your own, everything else is taken care of. It's like Jesus saying, seek first or I'll say seek only the kingdom and everything else will come to you. You don't need to do anything else, but seek that experience. That's why we come here every morning. We're seeking the experience of the one, the breakthrough. Now you will know that you have experienced, that you have broken through one of the ways that you will know. And this is how it came to me. The instant you break through the clouds or the instant the scales fall off your eyes as they did for Paul when, when he was in, on his, well, when he was on the road to Tarsus, he was blinded. But when he was in Tarsus, he was guided to the man that Jesus was leading him to, and he washed the scales from his eyes. And when that happened, suddenly he could see that which was always in front of him. And the first thought in your mind is, how could I not have seen this? It's, it's been right here in front of me the whole time. How could I have not have known this experience of oneness? It has always been here. But the other example that, that you heard me use is when I was 18 and I, I, I thought I had perfect vision. I thought I saw everything clearly. Until a friend had glasses, I said, I wonder what I look like with glasses. 
oh my God. I didn't realize that I couldn't see until I put on the glasses. I thought I saw fine. How many of us within the egoic mind think, oh, I can see everything clearly. I've got it all together. But it's only when you put on the glasses of oneness and, and reality comes into focus that I realize that, as Jesus said, they have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. We are all called, but few answer the call. You have answered the call. You're, you're here, either physically or however you're here, participating because the scales are falling from your eyes now. And at last you can see. So there's only one focus. And, and when we have that single focus, everything else will come into perfect clarity. Just like it says here. Everything has a purpose. The, the, the soul or the oneness cannot take on the ego's purpose and the ego cannot take on the soul's purpose. You make the choice. And every moment you're making that choice, this is the mind training that Calico and others talk about so much. You have to train your mind to hold to a single purpose. And the means to that single purpose is what? Who knows? love but there's one before that you're getting close these are all good forgiveness forgiveness is the means and what is forgiveness forgiveness is the realization that the sin that i thought i committed or someone committed against me in reality never even happened it never even happened we need to to jump off the screen in other words, if, if we've been watching a movie for a long time and, and we get so, how many of you have gotten so into a movie before that, that you forget that you're the one sitting watching the movie and, and you, you, you feel as if you're on the screen, the projection. And that's what we've done. We, we have become so immersed in this movie, this drama that we have forgotten. I am the one watching I'm not the one on the screen. So it's time to jump off the screen. And the instant we do, the, the, the projectionist says, oh, they don't care anymore, so they turn off the projector. Isn't that a wonderful day when the projector just goes off? And what, what happens if you're in a movie theater and the projector goes off? Do you just sit there waiting for the projection to come back on? You might. But more than likely, you're going to say, okay, I guess the movie's over. And you leave the theater. You walk out into the real world. That's what we're doing. We're stepping out into the real world. So let's hear what Vicki has to say about this. Good morning, Victoria. Morning, Brother James. Good morning, everybody. Well, I loved all of those little diagrams, Maslow's and yours. I think we should do a recording of the kitchen talks and the breakfast talks at the breakfast table with you and Calico and everyone. Having been there, I really appreciate Isn't it a good idea? We'll and do that one of these days. All right. But so I had we'll another record our another, breakfast conversation. Right. So I had another diagram to give you, but I, I, I don't have to write it out. Also, on your diagram of survive and dominate and belong in one. Right between belong and one, I would put give because it becomes an overwhelming urge to give. And then you come into the fullness of oneness where there's nothing to do, it's being. So here's another one. Here's another little, um, another little uh, hierarchy. So we start with me consciousness. You know, me, 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 whether it's the infant or the child or any of us, we start with me. And then and this is a spiritual um, little hierarchy. We go into the I am. Oh, the higher self, the Christ self, the Buddha self, the I am, that higher self, I am. Then what happens? Experientially, we go into a we consciousness. We go from simply I am to the realization we all are that, we are that, to, the, to another level where we experience all, not just I am, you are, we are, it's all life, the allness, 
the what you call omnipresence, the allness of life of what we are. Then we come into that oneness that does seem to transcend. That's that vision of the field. I'll meet you in that field. It's that oneness of being that almost has no effort to doing. Anyway, so I was I would offer you that. And the other thing I would pick up on, this is from your original um, reading, purpose. And I was thinking, now what's the simplest way? I like to come down to the simplest way to understand purpose and how this shift occurs. Because when you're talking about forgiveness, that is the way. And yesterday, it was a wonderful analogy to use the shadow. That was a wonderful image because if you see everything as nothing but a shadow, you recognize there's nothing there, nothing to forgive. It's all inclusive in seeing it, or even in our, even in this consciousness, to see it as a shadow. And it's kind of like a shadow awareness. That's what forgiveness is. None of it matters, good or bad. You know, whether you're in a prison or a palace, it's a shadow. And it's not so. Peace comes from the inner state of where we abide, where we live. So that if I go to purpose, the purpose, when I go down to the to the most common denominator, is either I'm in charge or God's in charge. I'm in charge are full of vain Im imaginings that you talk about, desires magic solutions, those are the scales on Paul's eyes, on all our eyes, those are the scales. And if we want the scales to be washed away, all we have to do is not hold on to them, keep them, keep using them anymore, find purpose in the scales, purpose in our ambitions, in our desires, in our, all, the, this is the difference between vision. This is when we live from inspiration rather than from ego-driven ideas. And that's the difference in being in the world and not of it. We'll still find ourselves here, but our purpose isn't to fulfill some short-term goal, even if it's a wonderful goal, ecology and save the trees and everything else. That can never be a fulfillment because it's still a level of what you call vain imaginings. The only thing that can be a fulfillment is the action that comes from inspiration, from the oneness that we are, that inspires us to express and give of who and what we are, the allness of what we are, in a way that blesses everyone and everything. And it may be to save the trees, save the water, save the country, save the whatever. But the purpose of it will not be to maintain you know, buildings and time and, and systems of time, the purpose will be to move through all systems of time into that presence of peace, that presence of love and wholeness that we are embodied with, that we're cradled in, that we're in, that we're blessed and loved in. So purpose, I'm in charge, God's in charge with everything. So what do I eat? What do I wear? Where do I go today? Who will I have dinner with? I'm in charge. I'll decide this, this, and this. God's in charge. What would you have me do? Show me your way. See the difference? And then the peace that comes from that. There's no burden of responsibility. There's the freedom of being God's child. Either I'm God's kid or I'm in charge of me. I don't want to be in charge of me. I was a very good problem solver. I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. I don't solve anything. I look at it with welcome and wonder. I wonder what spirit's going to do with all this. I wonder. It'll end up being the celebration of peace and happiness because I'm willing. Jesus says, I need your mind for the atonement. What does that mean? I need your mind to stay in one will. God's will is mine. And I'm grateful for that. And I love that. And it's great that God's in charge and I'm his kid. When our minds stay living there, then all that's happening is the fading away of all fear and negativity that fuel vain imaginings, ambition, and the edifices of this world. So that's, that's what we're doing here.
we're, we're living in the peace of what love and truth are, what our oneness is, and looking and letting it unfold because God really is in charge. Spirit, spirit's in charge. Spirit guides, spirit provides. That's it, Brother James. That's where I'm going. <laughs> right. Wow. I'll let you know where I go for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm I'm feeling such gratitude right now. I'm just looking out at everyone here and everyone here. And just, how blessed are we to be able to join together every morning and just get this boost, this this energetic boost, like rock, like a rocket ship, just straight out. Let, honor, honor that. Feel that gratitude. We are so blessed to join in this way, to support one another, to be mighty companions to one another. To have people like Vicky and many, many others out there who are with us. And I, I want to close. I was just reading a little further here in this uh, chapter in the course, chapter 20. So I want to read one sentence to close us up. It says, vision will come to you at first in glimpses. But they will be enough to show you what is given you who see your brother or your sister, sinless. Those glimpses will be enough for you to see everyone around you as sinless, just a glimpse. Truth is restored to you through your desire, your desire, as it was lost to you through your desire for something else. It's the something else that tripped us up. You see that? At some point in, in the soul's journey, there was the, this crazy idea came in of something else. There is no something else within the experience of the one. There's just more expansion of that experience of one. But not as a separate something else. Do you remember what we've been saying lately? It, the, the problem, what, what was always when our, our longing for everything got lost in every Thing. We've separated it. Let's bring it back together. Let, let's keep it right where it belongs, right there in focus on the one. And everything else will be given to you. And we say together, Amen, 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 e punto. Namaste, everyone. Have a beautiful day. We love you. Namaste. Thank you. Keep them laughing. Any blessings, everybody. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Much love.